Well, welcome to our webinar for today. My name is Julie Garden Robinson, and I'm very happy to um, host another series of webinars again this year. Next week, we will be featuring Esther McGinnis. She is an associate professor and NDSU Extension horticulturalist. And then you'll hear from me on March 4th. I'm a food and nutrition specialist, and I'll be talking about some of the old and new ways to preserve and also prepare vegetables. Next slide. Um, we've already been practicing a little bit, so if you're watching live, um, you'll be able to text in some questions in the chat box. And at the end of the session, I will pose those questions to Tom. I do have a short online survey. This whole project is made possible through a grant from the U.S. Department of Ag and also through North Dakota Department of Ag. So I do ask that you just take a couple minutes to do the short online survey. It will be emailed to you shortly after today's webinar. And also be sure to sign up for the opportunity to win a prize. And I have the prizes in my office and you'll want these prizes. So please fill out the survey. And now we are ready for Tom to tell us about growing tomatoes in North Dakota. But before he starts, I'd like to tell you a couple things about Tom. Tom Kalb is an extension horticulturalist with NDSU Extension. Tom was raised on a farm in Minnesota where his family managed a commercial apple orchard and 15 acres of vegetables and berries. Tom coordinates the North Dakota Home Garden Variety Trials and the state's Junior Master Gardener program. He's also the author of the NDSU Yard and Garden Report, which is a popular newsletter for gardeners in North Dakota. And with that, thank you so much for providing a webinar again this year, Tom. Okay, Julia, it's my pleasure. And um, you always have my full support. If there's anything I can do to help the cause, just let me know. And I want to welcome everybody out there, too. Thanks for being here today. We're going to talk about the most popular vegetable that we grow here in North Dakota, and that are tomatoes. Why do we grow tomatoes? Uh, also called love apples because they're so beautiful. Because we grow tomatoes because they are irresistible. They're irresistible off the vine. We can use them in delicious pizza and pasta. And I also, I love grow cherry tomatoes in the garden, just uh, out there popping a few tomatoes in my mouth and enjoying nature's goodness. We're going to talk about growing tomatoes from seed to the harvest. And we're just going to, just over, we don't have time to cover everything in depth, but we'll cover everything a little bit. And also, of course, I welcome your questions. I like informal talks as much as possible. And I... You know, any questions that you have are just great. So let's start with, first of all, soon, if you haven't already, you got to start ordering your tomato seed if you want to start your seeds. And I know you had a, a talk a couple weeks ago from Randy Nelson about a, how to start your seed successfully. And so I re recommend you refer to Randy's talk if you want the details about how to be successful growing seeds. But when I look for tomato varieties, I look for varieties that are early. And that's because North Dakota's growing season is so short and uh, we have one of the shortest growing seasons in America and it seems like just by the time the tomatoes really start coming we start worrying about jack frost so I look for the earliest varieties I can find I want a variety that's going to give me lots of tomatoes and I want a variety that will resist diseases naturally I don't want to be spraying toxic fungicides in my garden if it's not necessary and so look for the, the disease resistant varieties and of course you got to pick something that's flavorful otherwise what's the point huh there we go and there's all kinds of tomatoes there's the standard or sometimes called fresh market tomatoes there's canning tomatoes like this Roma and there's uh, lots of types of cherry tomatoes and here's one uh, yellow pear. I don't know if has anybody ever grown yellow pear. It's it's one of the mildest tasting ones out there. 
um, one of the sweetest tomatoes out there. It's an, it's an old heirloom, and a yellow pear tomato just grows like a shrub in the garden. It's just loaded with these delicious fruits. And there's even one, a yellow pear from Fargo that was developed that has a bigger size fruit, so you can look for that, the Fargo yellow pear. Let's, there's hundreds of varieties of tomatoes because they are so popular and um, there's lots of heirlooms out there. Let's just talk for a second about heirlooms. In general, I'm not a big fan of heirlooms and that's because I believe, you know, we've made progress over the last century, you know, like I didn't come to work today in a horse and buggy. I took a car, we made progress. And similar with tomato varieties. We've made progress and you know heirlooms some of their shortcomings is that they're less reliable in their production they're more susceptible to diseases um, they're generally less productive than today's modern varieties they're thin skinned and more susceptible to cracking than today's modern varieties but on the other hand you got to realize that in the past there was a gr I think there was a greater emphasis on flavor and less emphasis on reliability and yields. And so there's a lot of heirlooms that have remarkable flavors. And so I always put in a couple heirlooms in my garden every year and I come in with low expectations that I may not get a great yield. But on the other hand, you know, um, the few tomatoes that I will get, I'll treasure. And I'm just gonna, Maybe I should shut off the video so we don't get disrupted here. Excuse me one second here. There we go. And maybe if June could turn off her video, that'd be great too. If you could turn it off, June. Okay, we're just gonna okay great thank you okay let's move ahead one thing about heirlooms is that they are uh, a lot of them are indeterminate types. There are determinate and indeterminate types in general. We, so that's one consideration when you select a variety. Determinate types are generally easier to grow. The, their, their vine growth stops when the flowers of the vine appear. And so the, the plants stay compact. You don't have to prune determinate types and the trellising is optional. Another thing about determinants is generally they're earlier, which again is a big plus in North Dakota, and they'll give us a concentrated yield. On the other hand, indeterminate types have a vine growth that never stops. That's until the plant dies. And but they have to be pruned and trellised. The one benefit about an indeterminate type is they have a long harvest season. So like, hey, if I lived in Florida, I would like an indeterminate variety to to get that long harvest. But I live in North Dakota where I appreciate any harvest and especially an early harvest. So both are fine, but determinate ones have advantages. Here's some of the most popular varieties in North Dakota in our trials. I'll just go over them briefly here. And early girl, people like that because it's early and it is productive. It's, it have, I have an eye after that indicating it's an indeterminate variety, but it's not that vigorous. Celebrity, I think it's the most reliable and widely adapted tomato. So I always put in some celebrity. It has excellent resistance to diseases in general. Mountain Fresh Plus is a very popular tomato. It tolerates cool temperatures. It's one of the most popular among commercial growers in the Midwest has nice uh, eight ounce to even 16 ounce fruits and it's very productive and easy to grow. If you like a meaty tomato, a beef steak, then big beef is a relatively modern variety that, that's uh, very reliable and delicious. Roma's a popular canning variety and among cherries, I think Super Sweet 100 is the most popular because it has amazing productivity. 
And, but on the other hand, one drawback about super sweet 100s and cherry tomatoes in general is that they crack easily. And so in our trials, we found other uh, varieties that are less susceptible to crack, and that would include Juliet, this AAS winner, the All America Selections winner. And I invite you to try that one. It's absolutely delicious and less susceptible to cracking. And then I just have to throw in my personal favorite are the golden cherry tomatoes and sun gold and sun sugar. If you've never tried them, I really invite you to put in a vine of them this year. You will just be absolutely delighted as the, the sweetness and the firmness of the fruits. They're truly outstanding. And maybe, you know, at the end of the talk, like if we, if we have some time to chat, if anybody has a variety that they recommend, I and want to share with the group. I always like to get new ideas from other gardeners. There are some other uh, tomatoes that we can buy, and I think some are kind of gimmicky. One is the ketchup and fry tom tato, which is, you know, tomatoes and potatoes, they're in the same family, and you can graft a tomato vine onto a potato vine. And on one vine, then you can have, you can produce potatoes and tomatoes. And so they say this is really good for us, a very small garden. But my experience is a lot of these gimmicks are, there's no particularly, there's no synergy between these two plants. And usually you just get a poor crop of both. And likewise with these topsy-turvy tomatoes, these ones that grow upside down, you see a lot of commercials on them. Uh, you'll be seeing in about a month, you'll start seeing these TV commercials a lot about these types of tomatoes. That It's just a gimmick. And uh, I've, I've never seen a real successful topsy-turvy tomato because I think the biggest reason is the container itself is so small. A tomato root system is one of the most extensive of all vegetables, and it really struggles in such a small container. And uh, it's, it's hard to keep uniform moisture in this container, and that makes this tomato especially sensitive to blossom and rot. So just, you know, it's for fun, but... I have some low expectations with these guys. So, Tom, I'm going to pop in because we yeah. have a pertinent question okay. here. Would grafting the potatoes and tomatoes affect the pH of the tomato fruit? Uh, I doubt it. I, I don't think um, you would have the same pH as the tomato itself originally. I don't think there'd be an appreciable change. Okay. Usually grafting has very uh, minor changes on the quality of the fruit itself. But I've, I've never heard about pH, and I know that's a factor for canning, Julie. But uh, so, sometimes they say uh, uh, the graft, you, can, you can select special grafts that uh, slightly modify the sweetness or improve the vigor of the plant. But I've never heard about that about, um, with the potato graft. Again, I think this is just a crazy gimmick. Okay. Good question, Donna. There you go. And also, uh, actually, I can see these questions too here. And yes, we will be passing out free tomato seeds at Spring Fever again. So stay tuned for that. Okay, let's keep going. If I can just, here we go. Okay, indeterminate types have to be pruned. And I think a lot of people, get a little bit scared about like they don't know what to prune so I'll, I'll just keep it really simple and this this uh, diagram shows it all uh, quite concisely you now we start with um, the tomato vine the stem the main stem and then at the base of every tomato leaf comes a new vine we call it a sucker that's at the at the base of every tomato leaf and you see like this Actually, this tomato leaf at the bottom is composed, it's one leaf there with five leaflets. But at the base there, you'll see a sucker. And usually, if you're going to prune an indeterminate tomato, you choose to have either only one vine, which you would prune off every sucker, and you have to do this on a regular basis through the summer. Or many gardeners like to use the two vine method. So then we have to choose one of the suckers to be the secondary vine. And so 
what I do is I look at the first flower cluster towards the bottom of the vine, the main right. vine. And it's surprising, but you'll really see on a consistent basis, below that first flower cluster, you will see a vigorous sucker, a thick sucker. And you can leave that particular sucker to be your second vine. But then also we want to trim off all the suckers above that and also all the suckers below that in pruning. And also as a way to limit diseases, and diseases come from the soil, we like to trim off the leaves that come into contact with the soil. So the lower leaves we often trim off because they don't really do much good after a while because they get shaded and they just become a magnet to soil diseases. Okay, um, as far as fertilizing tomatoes, there's a, just a couple important points. One is, first of all, the, the first point is in general, people look, let me just start a couple things. One is, if you really want to know what's the best way to fertilize your garden, get a soil test. And NDSU provides a soil test services for you. You can go online at the soil testing lab and you can, you can get your soil test in your garden. It's like $18. It could be a great investment because actually most people over fertilize. But just in general, the general recommendation of vegetable gardens in the early spring is to start off with about one pound of 10, 10, 10 for every 100 square feet of garden. And the second number, the phosphate, is particularly critical in seedling growth. But then after that, I'd ask you to refrain from fertilizing because especially if you put too much nitrogen in the soil, you're going to get a lot of leafy growth and tomatoes can get very vigorous in their leaves and this will take away from their fruit production. So I wait to side dress until after I see the first fruit set because I want the plant to be, I want it to be triggered to go into its reproductive stage. And so we don't want to put on too much nitrogen in the beginning. Wait till after that fruit set and then's the time to side dress and just slightly, you know, maybe just a, a tablespoon, tablespoon and a half um, around the base of the plant. But it's important to, this is the art of gardening, is to keep your eyes on your plants, you know? If you see your plants have are pale, that means they need a little bit of fertilizer. On the other hand, if it's lush green vines without flowers, you're giving your plants too much fertilizer. But I often get the question like, what's the best fertilizer for my garden? And I really think the best thing you can give your garden is this, and that is your shadow. Give your shadow to your garden. And these are the, the best gardeners spend time in their garden. They give their shadow to their plants. And I know there's a saying among Native American tribes that the best thing to give your land is your footprint. You know, give your attention to your garden. Because when you're out there in the garden, you'll see what's going on. Say, oh my gosh, you are looking pale. I think you need a little bit of fertilizer. Or oh my gosh, I see a few aphids there. Let me wash them off before it becomes a problem. So so let's um, give your shadow to your garden. And also just another reminder, let's all keep our microphones off, people. Okay. Next thing to talk about is after fertilizing is mulching. And mulching can be especially important to tomatoes for several reasons, but especially because it can accelerate the growth rate. We can get an earlier harvest because we can mulch to generate heat in the garden, and tomatoes love the heat. Mulching can also protect plants from soil diseases. Again, most of the diseases on tomatoes start from the soil and work their way up the plant. So if we put mulching between the soil and the plant, this can serve as a barrier, uh, protecting our plants from diseases. Mulching can conserve moisture, and that's very important in our state. We live in a semi-arid state, and moisture is the most limiting factor in most people's vegetable crops. So mulch can help conserve moisture, and there are some mulches that will repel insects. I know that this, these are some cucumbers here, and I saw this at a planting in Fargo, and I just had to take a picture of it. You saw clear plastic mulch 
on this cucumber planting right next to a plant that isn't mulch. And can you just see how the heat generated from the clear plastic mulch has moved those plants along? They're 10 to 14 days ahead of the cucumbers without mulching. And otherwise, all the other conditions are the same. Here's a picture of black plastic mulching on peppers. And black plastic mulching is the most common type of mulching used in vegetable crops. But if you want to get the heat benefit from black plastic mulching, you have to have the black plastic touching the soil. So you have to put it on taut so that the heat that's absorbed by the black plastic can be transferred to the soil. The color of the mulching can make a difference. And it's kind of interesting that tomatoes especially respond well to red plastic mulching. You can get a 20% yield increase by using red plastic mulching because the, the light that's reflected off the red plastic stimulates photosynthesis in tomatoes. So again, to maximize yields, consider red plastic mulching. Here's a summary of some of the benefits of different types of mulching. The red plastic gives us our highest yield. The clear plastic generates the most heat, but weeds will grow underneath the mulch and that can be an issue. Black plastic will generate heat and it will also prevent weeds underneath from growing. So that's very common to use. Silver mulching is used in many places across the USA, but not so much in um, North Dakota, silver mulching will provide a minimal amount of heat, a little bit. It reflects the sunlight and that helps plant growth. But an interesting thing about silver mulch, it, it controls insects, especially aphids. And that's because it reflects the sun. And so what happens is that as an aphid approaches the tomato vine, it looks down and it, it sees the sky reflecting. So it goes it looks up, it sees the sky. It looks down, it sees the sky. And then the aphid just gets confused and has, does a crash landing into the mulch and it dies. It, it's, it does have some impact. Straw mulching is used in tomato planting, but I want to caution us that straw mulching will moderate the heat of summer. But we want to get let our ground warm up. So don't put the straw mulch on right away. Wait till we're into summer and the soil has already warmed up. Landscape fabric can be used in, in uh, tomato plantings and the benefit of that is it's reusable and there are special landscape fabrics being developed now with little needle uh, holes created that allow for some water to pass through. So look for those types of weed barriers. The next thing to talk about is trellising. It's important to get your tomatoes off the ground. And there's the benefits is you'll have better air circulation in the planting. This will lead to fewer diseases. We'll get those vines off that disease infected soil and we'll have better fruit quality because the fruit won't rot in the ground. The negatives to trellising is it costs money. Also, because the plants are, are, uh, are off the ground and the soil is exposed, you're going to ha have to pay more attention to irrigation if you trellis your plants. And because there's going to be some inconsistencies in soil moisture, you're going to get a greater risk of blossom and rot. Here's an example of a very common way to uh, trellis tomatoes and that is a bamboo stake that you just pound into the ground, pound it a couple feet in the ground and then this will work with compact types and also an indeterminate type if you limit it to one vine. So the, the, the classic uh, bamboo stake is very commonly used. Some gardeners, especially in a greenhouse, they will use string and what they do is you have a like a, a horizontal support often a wire that's about eight foot off the ground that, that uh, it goes above the row and then from that wire you drop a string and then you just then at the end of the string you attach it to the base of the tomato vine and then you just wind the tomato vine around the string as it grows and grows through the year. So you got to have that horse like just like a uh, pole beans you know you have to have a uh, like a wire about eight feet up going down the row. 
Here's a very popular system that I don't see too much of here in our state, but it's used elsewhere, especially in commercial plantings, is the string weave system in which you pound a stake between every two tomato vines and then you wind a string around the planting. And here's an actual view of it. You can see that, that uh, you have like a, a sturdy twine or a thick string and you, you just, it goes around either side of the tomato planting and you put up a new support string about every eight inches up the plant. And you just, you end up trading, you'll have about four strings going up the whole way by the end of the year and you'll have like a wall of tomatoes. It's, and you see the benefits, it gets all the tomato vine off the, off the ground. That's the string weave system. Cages are popular in home gardens, and I would encourage you to make your own cages and make them sturdy. Use that concrete reinforcing mesh, and there's some information about how you can, the details about how to do it. One nice thing, a couple things, like one, it's, it can be valuable to support the cage with a stake because it's very windy in our plantings. And also you can wrap a plastic sheet around the cage to, again, generate some heat to get our plants off to a strong start. There's an old cage that's been through many summers producing lots of tomatoes for that gardener. There's been studies that are trying to indicate which is the best way to go with trellising, and each one has its advantages. Like the string weave system, or the string system, or this is similar to the staking system. Because the plant is so upright and the ground has an opportunity to warm up quicker, the, a string system will give you early tomatoes, and also you'll, you'll have a good individual fruit size. But as far as marketable yield, the caging will lead to a higher marketable yield. But again, as far as fruit quality, the whole, they're all the string, the cage, or the string weave system will all give you outstanding fruit quality. And the, letting the tomato vine sprawl, it's just, you get so many tomatoes will rot. And so that's, that gets the lowest rating. And lastly, what's most affordable? Doing nothing. Just let the tomato vines sprawl. So you can kind of just see that each of the systems has its advantages and disadvantages. Okay, let's move on to pest control. And I saw this at a community garden here in Bismarck, and man, it just totally broke my heart. I, you know, um, I don't, tomatoes, one nice thing about, you know, much of the tomato vine, I think just about everything except for the fruit itself is toxic. And generally, a lot of, a lot of, uh, not, we rarely have insect problems with tomatoes. And so really have to uh, advise you to, uh, you don't need to use preventative insecticides on tomatoes. Because again, we rarely have a problem with tomatoes. So the, like the person put the seven dust in here, it's just rarely a problem with tomatoes. So, so don't do that. The number one pest that I've seen as far as insects go is the tomato hornworm. And this is a giant caterpillar. It can get oh, at least four inches long. It's called a garden glutton because it, can, it has an amazing appetite. It can eat four times its weight every day. So just imagine that was, that was the average person, 150 pounds. That's like eating 600 pounds of food every day. That is what I call, that's a major appetite. So what, what would that be like? If you're like a 150-pound person, and let's say you had a Big Mac attack, you wouldn't go to McDonald's for a Big Mac or two Big Macs. If you had the appetite of a hornworm, you would have 600 Big Macs. You would have 600 large fries to go with it. And because you believe in a balanced diet, you would have 100 side salads to go with that. And a sweet tooth, okay, 100 ice cream cones. And because you have a special love for tomatoes, you can have 1,000 packets of ketchup to go with this every day so the appetite of this hornworm it's it's likened to 
its growth rate in a month is similar to a cat becoming the size of an elephant in one month. Amazing. And so if you do get, in, if you do get uh, hornworms in your planting, you will see a difference. I've seen, I've seen a third of a vine a third of an entire plant eaten overnight. And, uh, but the nice thing about hornworms is they're, they're really easy to control. I just, actually, you can, once, you, once you see, what the heck happened to my vine? And then you see that guy uh, just staring at you. All you got to do is pick it off, and I just step on it, put it, my old size 12 foot on it, and that's the end of it. But there are other tools, if that's too gory for you. There are natural insecticides that we got, we got available for you. And that, this is a nice a nice trend in gardening now is the natural insects are less toxic to people and have a shorter life in the environment. And we can go over some of these briefly. The BT, the Bacillus thuringiensis, is the most popular natural insecticide. It's a natural bacterium and it causes, it will cause a hornworm or a caterpillar to get, uh, it, it destroys the gut, the stomach of the caterpillar and it will die after two days so like a, a slow death spinosad is a relatively new insecticide it's also it's safe for people and it has it's a nerve poison it causes paralysis but again it takes about a day or two to work neem has been used in gardening for centuries and centuries it has an unusual it, it when you spray neem on a plant it it has repellent properties. It, the insects, when they're, when they're exposed to neem, they, they lose their appetite. And also, they don't develop hormonally. So they never have children. So that's a very slow-acting one. If you need something with quick action, pyrethrin is a nerve agent that acts uh, immediately on an insect. And, but again, has a very short life in the environment, just a couple days in the sunlight, and it can break down. Insecticidal soap is another good tool, but you have to spray that soap, which dries out the pest. You have to spray the soap on the bug itself. Some people, when they see hornworms or other insects in the garden, they they're they're less um, they just want revenge. And I call them what I call the dirty, hairy Clint Eastwood type of guard gardeners. Yeah, make my day. What are you doing messing around my patch? And so then you use carbril or a pyrethroid. These are nerve agents that kill on contact. And, you know, if you ever use it, like, like let's say you do it on cabbage moths, you, know, you spray this, you spray carbril or a pyrethroid, like seven is one of these products. You spray the seven on those, those caterpillars and you can watch them drop down off that plant right away. And you can see that nerve poison work and you can see them shaking uncontrollably just for a few seconds before they die so it's you know if you like revenge it can be very sweet using these potent insecticides but again it's like a loaded gun you have to use it with caution and uh follow the label carefully it's done. <laughs> although insects are rare was there in, a, in a tomato planting, I think the the fungal diseases are very common, and a couple are most common. One is septoria leaf spot. You see these little, uh, like one quarter inch brown to burgundy lesions on the leaves. They start at the it starts from the base and moves its way up the plant. Very common. Early blight is another common one. And it has larger brown lesions. And if you look carefully at the lesions, sometimes you can see concentric circles in it. That's early blight. One of the most common ways this spreads has to do with improper watering. You know, it, when you use overhead irrigation, you know, then you get done with it, you go, oh my God, this looks so, look how sparkling my leaves look. Wow, those, it's so beautiful, my garden. But actually, your plants hate it when you do this because you just gave the, a, a, prime, uh, a prime situation for diseases to develop. So avoid overhead irrigation because it just promotes diseases on the leaves. 
in general, avoid overhead irrigation. If you do irrigate, irrigate in the morning and then water deeply, not frequently. Okay, if you irrigate in the morning, the leaves have a chance to dry out before the night comes. And then if you water deeply, the, the roots will grow where the water is. If you water deep, the roots will grow deep. So I really think twice a week is all you need to water. And mulching can help a lot to conserve moisture. For, to attack these common fungal diseases, look for modern resistant varieties. They're, they're, they're not going to be immune to disease, but they will show some resistance, some degree of resistance. And we're getting better varieties all the time. We got ones that are resistant to, to early blight and late blight today. Rotate your crops. Plant your tomatoes and its relatives. They all get the same diseases, the tomatoes, the peppers, potatoes, eggplant. They all get the same diseases. So rotate those crops in a different area of the garden the next year so we don't build up that disease in that area of the garden. When you plant your tomatoes, space out your plants so they get lots of sun and air movement. Avoid splashing the soil because that's where the diseases start. If you want to, there are protective fungicides available. And for you can use chlorothalonil, which is the most widely available fungicide at a garden center. Or if you're organic, copper will do a good job at protecting against infection. It won't cure it, but it'll prevent it. And then cleaning up the garden at the end of the year can help. Just a couple other things to wind up our talk here today about. One is, the, i got to talk about blossom end rot because this is by far the number one problem that attacks us as tomato gardeners. And you see that hard brown rot on the bottom of the fruit. Blossom end rot is caused by a calcium deficiency. But the calcium is likely abundant in the soil. The problem is the calcium's not getting to the fruits. And so we have to do whatever we can to help the calcium in the soil to get to the fruits. And one way is to be careful when you cultivate so you don't hurt the root system of the plant. Because we need those roots to obtain it, to mine out the calcium from the soil. So be careful when you cultivate, don't damage roots. Also, try to maintain soil moisture, a uniform amount in the, in the soil, because that way the calcium can be in the soil solution and taken up by the roots. And then mulching can help to maintain good soil moisture. We want to avoid too much nitrogen because leaves actively fight the fruits for the calcium. So we don't want to have too much of a leafy plant, and especially ammonia, uh, nitrogen, and that'd be like 10, 10, 10, or ammonium nitrate, which are very common sources of nitrogen, lead to flushes of leaf growth that can lead to more blossom at problems. Calcium nitrate, nitrate would be a better solution. And if you want to, there are sprays. You can, or you can, use, you can spray calcium nitrate onto the fruits not necessarily the plants, if you spray the fruits directly when they're young, that way we can help get more calcium to the planting. My personal experience is usually the first flush of fruits suffers the most. But then afterwards, after the first flush of fruits, the root system is more expansive. It can get the calcium the plant needs, the fruits need, and also the there's a, less of a, a flush of leaf growth robbing the fruits from their from their uh, calcium. So sometimes a little patience can help. Last thing I talk about is the second most problem that comes across my desk with tomatoes and that is herbicide injury. And you see this, this curling up of the leaves, that's definitely herbicide injury. Please only spray for dandelions or weeds when it's absolutely necessary. And the, when, you have most impact controlling weeds in your lawn in the fall. Actually, after a light frost, when your tomato vines may be already dead from the frost. But in the fall is when the plants, when the weeds, when you spray a weed, it will naturally absorb that chemical and bring it down into its roots as it 
gets in because everything in a in a weed flows downward as winter approaches as the weed starts to store food for for winter so spray your dandelions in the fall for more impact and then but sometimes people say i swear i didn't spray anything and i still got the tomato problem then to set another emerging source of herbicides is manure and that's because of the type of herbicides we use today in pastures and on grasslands are these herbicides are persistent if you spray a pasture with a herbicide to control weeds and then an animal like this horse grazes on that grass that was sprayed with the with the herbicide the herbicide goes right from the mouth of the horse or the cow and it goes through the entire body through the entire digestive tract without being assimilated by the animal. It goes in from one end and it goes out the other, right into the manure. And so people who apply manure in these situations will, will, are also applying a persistent herbicide to their garden. And tomatoes and potatoes are the most sensitive plants. And this herbicide can persist in a garden for a few years. So if possible, be aware of where your manure comes from. And if it's from, from uh, feeding materials that contain herbicide, be very cautious. So with that, I want to leave on a positive note and wish you a great tomato crop this year. And I'd um, be happy to open it up to any questions or comments people have. And you have a couple questions. Okay. Jennifer says, how do you recommend pruning tomatoes? Should you sanitize a tool between plants? Okay, there's no need to sanitize your tools between plants. And actually for suckers, a lot of people just use their, their thumb and forefinger. But if you want to, you can use a, a bypass pruners. You don't have to sterilize between cuts because hopefully there's not diseases in your planting yet. And we talked about how to prune in that or and that original thing is first to decide how many vines I'm going to have. Am I going to have one vine or two vines? And then I'm going to take out the suckers using that approach. If I have a two vine approach, I'll leave the sucker that's just beneath the first flower cluster. I'll prune all the leaves below that, you know, like let's say at least eight inches from the soil. So I don't want leaves touching the soil and just keep my eyes on taking out the suckers. You don't want to go too aggressive in pruning because if the tomato fruits are too exposed to the sunlight, they'll get scalded. And if you have a determinate variety, you really don't have to do any uh, taking out of the suckers. Just take out some of the lower leaves. All right. And you have another question from Diane. What are your thoughts on using eggshells, banana peels, and coffee grounds or bone meal? Okay, uh, a lot of what you said is, uh, well, they're all good. You know, they're sources of banana peels, coffee grounds, and uh, eggshells are all sources of organic matter, and they can enrich the soil. But as far as, like, some people think uh, eggshells will be a good source of calcium in the soil to fight blossom and rot, but eggshells, um, again, we already have enough calcium in the soil. And also the eggshells have to be an extremely fine powder form to be taken up by the roots that year. So I like the idea of using any type of compost or organic matter in the garden, but it has its limitations. Bone meal um, can be, uh, read the label carefully, look, at see, look to see actually what's in that bone meal. What we're finding out nowadays is the way bone meal is processed today, it doesn't have as much, it's not a rich uh, source of phosphate as it was in the past, but it can be, a, a, a can be it can add to the fertility of the soil. Um, other good sources of organic fertilizer, cotton seed meal would be a good one, or um, Another one, milorganite can be useful in a garden situation. Um, fish emulsion can be a decent source of nitrogen as well. Good question. 
And then I put a note in, this is Julie Garden Robinson, and I keep our food preservation materials up to date. I just want to remind everybody that we do recommend acidifying all tomato varieties before you can them, and you can use citric acid or lemon juice. So we have all that information on our website. You don't have to acidify if you're going to freeze the tomatoes. So check out all those resources. And then we have a comment from Andrew. Do you know of a good replacement tomato for Floramerica? I can't get it anymore. Okay. Um, if I wanted, if I, first of all, before I'd give up, I would, uh, I think you could, I think if you're aggressive, you could find it. And what I would do to find, of course, you know, Google's magic these days. You can just Google Floramerica. There's a lot of heirloom tomato companies out there and you might you might be able to find a source of them um i would look for the catalog from totally tomatoes has over 200 tomato varieties there's uh, baker creek these for america's are heirlooms i look for baker creek seed savers exchange if you really want to aggress be aggressive there's a network, you could contact Seed Savers Exchange. They have a network of seed savers. Um, and they, in the past, they've offered 13,000 different varieties of vegetables. So I wouldn't give up on that yet if you really, if you live for Flor America. And if you want to, Andrew, if you want to send me an email, I can also search for you and find something. I f try to find that Flor America for you because I've heard of that too. It's not it's not an ancient variety. Um, but otherwise, again, I would gear you, Flor America is a fresh market variety. And so I would gear you, I think celebrity would be comparable or uh, that Mountain Fresh Plus would be comparable to a uh, Flor America. And Jennifer, I think has a question for me because I talked about acidifying with lemon juice, etc. Um, for vinegar, it's okay to use vinegar in, say, salsa formulations that have been developed using vinegar, but it probably would lend a more pickle-like taste to, to tomatoes, so we do recommend the lemon juice and the citric acid. Okay, any other questions out there? Well, thank you, Tom. This was very hey, interesting. Great. Anytime. And if anybody has any questions, you know, be, just send me an email. I'll be happy to help you. Good luck with your garden this year, everybody. Happy spring. <laughs>